nord comme au sud, il nous faut repenser les infrastructures, les routes, les ports, à l'aune de l'élévation du niveau de la mer, des événements climatiques violents, de la hausse des températures moyennes et des transformations. consacré à la biodiversité que nous avons organisé le 11 janvier dernier, en partenariat avec les Nations Unies et la mondiale s'inscrit aussi dans cette fois et a permis de lancer plusieurs initiatives fortes qui contribuent à la Par exemple, l'accélérateur de la grande marée d'Israël, qui doit renforcer la Welcome to South Asian Environment Dialogue. It's a program, as you all know, which discusses about the environment and climate change issues across South Asia. But as I said before, that why should only we consider South Asia? South Asia is only part of this huge global and global world. So. We'll be talking all about the issues, but South Asia is our focus. And today we'll be discussing an issue which is as important as anything we have discussed over the last four or five months. That is adaptation. We call it adaptation matters. Before going into the specific topics, let me let me share with you that this program is brought on by the Climate Channel, the Canadian Channel, Canadian Television Channel, Along with the Florence, the Indian media platform, and No TV Bangla, avec a YouTube channel from Bangladesh. Et et and you know that in recent times, there have been two major adaptation-related conferences all over the world. aussi d'avoir une action utile et coordonnée contre First les grandes inégalités de nos sociétés. Climate Summit, Climate Adaptation Summit 2021, and another is the Global Gobeshana Conference which I am told has gone on seven days, 24 hours in a day. It's unprecedented. I have never heard a conference like this. I am really, really keen to hear the details of it. And the Global but before Center doing that, my job is to introduce the, the very esteemed panel that I have with me. Throughout the economy. Let me start with Professor Salim Ulkhov, and he needs no risks. introduction in the field of climate change and environment, not only in South Asia, but globally. Summit. He is but still, I need, to, I, need to, I need to formally introduce him. He leads International Center for Climate Change and Development, ICCCAD, and he's also the advisor of so many kind of organizations and platforms in these development countries, a key person, a scientist, participating in the global negotiations. And Dr. Hall, such a, such a pleasure to have you again in this program. With the support an Thank, you very much. Thank you very much, Jayanta. Nice to be here. A group of five Absolute institutions privilege. from across banking, and we, investment, and today also have a we're demonstrating fascinating physical young assessment. climate Adaptation experts. is therefore essential. It's so good to see the young faces working and Investing talking about climate change. Resilience. Let's be introduced we'll one by one. Costs in the long term. All of them are from ICCAD, and not only by governments. Ms. Mahamuda Akhtar, research officer. Mahmouda, welcome yeah. to the show. Next to yeah. risks, Thank you. Hello, climate everyone. change and climate adaptation Thank you. Uh, we have opportunity. Tasfia Tasneem, Senior Research Associate. To discuss Hello, with companies nice to be here. how they can be more resilient Absolutely. for climate change. We have Jennifer Kadi, Youth Program Coordinator. Different crops. Hello, this is Jennifer. Great to be here. Different use of Absolutely. raw materials can actually we have Sarah be Farin part of the Khan, response. Program Assistant. Thank you for having us. Good afternoon. Opportunities. Absolutely. I'm encouraged by the current trends towards green finance globally, but there needs to be more focus on preparing for climate shocks as well as reducing emissions. The various initiatives in the field of climate adaptation that I spoke about require openness about where we stand as a bank. What has and has not I'm been successful. Looking forward to talk to all of you. What we will Sharin Manan. Senior we will research do so officer. ourselves, and we also well, encourage well, other financial you institutions for having us to here pay today. more attention Great. to climate change. Fascinating, fascinating issues, uh, and to report on it, as well Professor as Professor Hogg, I'm really, really keen to hear about the adaptation together. The, the race to resilience conference. has but begun. Before that, we need to uh, point we all it know this, the trillions this, this of climate finance. adaptation this summit 2021 has been a financial uh, leaders committed to fully managing around. climate risks. So, and you, you are the best person. That how important this particular uh, program and 
I'm told that more than 50 kind of country leaders and others have joined and there have been various kind of uh, suggestion, recommendation and commitments. So if you just kind of talk us through a bit about this climate summit. Sure. Thank you very much, Jayanta. So let me start with a little His bit Excellency, of background to the summit. It Prime actually Mr. started Mark two Rook, years ago when a commission, a global commission on Bangladesh adaptation is uh, was set up, uh, headed by Mr. Ban Ki-moon, uh, the Jiro former Secretary for General of the UN, uh, also impacts. Mr. Bill Gates and uh, Ms. Kristalina Georgieva, who is now the head of the IMF. And a number of commissioners from around the world, including the from our part of, of the world. Uh, we had Sheila Patel from India and, and uh, Dr. Musa, the but head of BRAC in Bangladesh. Uh, and this commission, after a year, produced a major flagship report on adaptation that had a number of different adaptation due to the lack of financial and political will. At the, the COVID-19 uh, has proved summit in New York the importance in September of being 2019 under the, uh, on time. Uh, they had, had Bangladesh the has emerged Secretary as General a global Mr. leader Antonio on Guterres. And locally at that led summit, they declared a year of action which would culminate in a adaptation summit which would be hosted by the Prime Minister of the Netherlands who was also at that meeting. So was our Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. Um, and that originally the plan was for that summit to be a, a real summit with people, heads of government coming to Amsterdam in October last year. Uh, but then because of the pandemic, the date got shifted. It went to 25th January and it became a virtual summit. And uh, in the last few days, it was held as a virtual summit, again, hosted by the Prime Minister of the Netherlands. Mr. Ban Ki-moon was there virtually. Uh, John Kerry from the United States uh, spoke. It's the first international uh, conference for him. Our Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, uh, spoke again virtually. Um, and they had, as you said, more than 50 uh, heads of government and ministers from many different countries all speak, as well as heads of private sector companies, international agencies, UN agencies. And the way it, it was run, being a virtual event, they started with the high level event uh, hosted by the Dutch prime minister. And then they went around the world in two hour segments. They called them anchor events, which were on different topics that I mentioned earlier, agriculture, cities, urban infrastructure, finance. One of those anchor events was hosted by Bangladesh. It was on locally led adaptation. And that is the topic which we specialize in. And it's about how to help the most vulnerable communities uh, to adapt to the impacts of climate change, which is also the topic that we had in the Gobeshana conference, which took place prior to that. So the adaptation summit was a major success. Uh, organizations and, and leaders from all over the world participated over 24 hours in these different uh, events that took place. And now we are going forward with a 10-year action plan over the next 10 years of actually implementing all the different activities and promises that we uh, came up with. All, all of them had an action plan associated with them. In the case of the locally led adaptation track, which we were part of, uh, it is about applying the principles of locally led adaptation, which means enabling the poor and vulnerable communities who are being affected to take a lead in, in deciding what is needed. At the moment, other people, governments and international agencies decide on their behalf what they need exactly. without consulting them. And you have this experience working at the grassroots in Shundarban as well. So we want to reverse that that uh, procedure or paradigm, which is a very top-down one with a more bottom-up approach. We need to listen to them. We need to respect them. We need to take their views into account because they know their problems better than mm -hmm. we, the outsiders, Absolutely. know it. And we need to be helping them rather than telling them what to do. So that is the, the, uh, the outcome that we are hoping to achieve. We, we got everybody to sign up to it in principle. That's the good news. Now we need them to do it. Let us see if they can do that, or we can make them do that. Uh, before going to the Gobeshana conference part, just a quick supplementary question that this switchover in US, uh, how it kind of affected the moods in the climate negotiation? Because I understand this is the first major global conference post Trump era. So you have noticed any, any change of mood, any kind of directional change in here? 
absolutely. I must say, I'm I'm very very pleasantly surprised uh, by the the change in the current administration compared to the previous one. We knew that was going to happen, uh, but on the other hand, since they came into power, and we're only talking a matter of a few days, mm -hmm. uh, the new administration has taken climate change so much more seriously that they they're actually amazing everybody by how proactive they are being. Yesterday, uh, the Biden administration had a climate day where they had, I think, 30 different new initiatives that the United States is taking, including international ones uh, led by John Kerry, who is the new uh, climate envoy of uh, President Biden. So they are definitely moving out of the block uh, very fast, positive direction, good energy, uh, very welcome for the rest of the world. Now they have to deliver. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So that, that bit, that bit, we need to uh, take a little bit of skepticism. They mm. let them show us, uh, mm. but they walk. They're talking the good talk. That's good. Absolutely. Let us Absolutely. see if they walk it. They, they walk it up because <laughs> even before Trump, everything was not hunky-dory when exactly. actually came to deliver. There were a lot exactly. of talks, but not deliver. Exactly. Let us now go to uh, yes, yes. Also, let, just if I can just add one other thing, the 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 issue right now is that. You know, they are coming back. Obama was OK. We had Paris under Obama and then we had Trump for four years. And now we have Biden coming in. These four years have not been good years. They have they have taken us back. So the U.S. is not joining at a point where they left. They're joining at a point where we are further behind. And so they need to make up. They have a yes. lot of ground to make up before absolutely. we ac accept them as an equal with us. Absolutely, the world has absolutely. Moved on. They have not moved with us. So, you know, there's a lot of catching up to do from the U.S., uh, and, and, uh, which we hope they'll do. We, I, I expect they will do. But they need to realize there is no, you know, there's no easy win here. They, they cannot assert leadership without showing genuine leadership. Absolutely. The ball is in their court. No doubt exactly. about that. Let me go to the Gobishana, Global Gobishana Conference. Uh, just take us through that because I'm told, again, I'm repeating it, that Continuous 24 hours for seven days. Is it a fact? It's a fact. Let me let me give you a little history first, and then I'll describe it, and I'll ask my colleagues to share with you their experiences of doing it. So the history is that uh, seven years ago, we started this initiative in Bangladesh called Gobeshana, which is Bangla for Research. And uh, it's an initiative bringing together the research community, universities, research institutes, government, non-government, NGOs, and others uh, to share information on climate change, uh, particularly research and knowledge on climate change. And the platform now has more than 50 organizations, many universities, and others. And among the many things that we do, every January, we used to hold a big conference. So until last year, it was uh, held in Dhaka at my university, the Independent University of Bangladesh. We would get three, four, sometimes four and a half, four, 450 people uh, from uh, uh, all over Bangladesh and also quite a lot of international participants, including from India and West Bengal. Uh, but they had to come to Dhaka to participate. Uh, and it was held over four days at our university. So this year, we decided to go online and virtual because uh, of the COVID restrictions. But since we were going online, we decided to try to see whether we can go from a local uh, conference to a global conference. And we reached out to friends around the world, asking them to see whether they wanted to join us. And we got a huge, overwhelming response. More than 90 uh, sessions were offered around the world. So in, in the end, we, we uh, organized it seven days long, 24 hours a day with three eight hour segments. The first eight hours for Asia Pacific region where we started it. Then uh, we handed over to friends in Africa and Europe because they are the same time zones. So another eight hours for the Africa Europe time zones. And then the final third eight hours were for the Americas time zone, North America, Central America, South America. And many of the South Americans did their sessions in Spanish as well. And then they came back to Asia and then we did another eight hours and another eight hours and another 24 hours. And my colleagues okay. who are on this panel uh, organized this whole event. And I, I, uh, I invited them to join us to tell, tell the story of uh, how we did it and how this I've, was organized. I'm going what to them, but, but before that, just sorry to interrupt you. How many 
how many presentations or how many lectures are being kind of part of it? Well, we had 90 different sessions. Okay. Uh, and within those, we had some of them were three hour long sessions with lots of presentations. Uh, some of them were short with one keynote presentation. We had some very high level speakers that I interviewed and they gave a presentation. So it was a variety of different kinds of sessions from all over the world. Uh, just to give you a flavor, we had uh, Ibaraki University in Japan talking about locally led adaptation in Japan. We had Griffith University in Australia talking about what they're doing. Uh, we had the University of Sussex doing a very interesting project in the Shundarbans, uh, which okay. my colleagues can talk about as well. Uh, and then we had North America. I had a very good conversation with the, uh, the resilience officer of Providence City in Rhode Island in the United States okay. about locally led adaptation. So the topic is local adaptation, but taking place in different parts of the world. So we brought together people who are working on adaptation in their own location, but then sharing lessons across the globe. And that worked very, very well, as surprisingly well. I didn't expect it to work so well. We connected Absolutely brilliant. people adapters Looking, around the world. I'm sure that some detailed reports is going to be coming out. And It'll we, be coming we out all soon. will be looking forward to because I think it can actually play a major role while working on the evidences leading to the Glasgow, especially in the Correct. adaptation sector. I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. Let me now go over to your colleagues and take a take an input from them. Uh, first, maybe Sara, Sara Farin Khan. I mean, Sara, yes. uh, you were the one who played a key role in overall organization, if I'm not wrong. Just share your experience with us that how it is, because I think it's also included the high level one. So what's your experience yeah. on that? Uh, thank you. Uh, so as Dr. Hawk already mentioned, this year the annual conference was held from the 18th to 24th of January. That is a whole long week, 24-7 conference focusing on locally led adaptation actions across different geographical regions like Asia, Africa, U Europe, Australia, Northern America, and several other regions. So being a part of the Govishana Global Conference organizing team, my role was like a liaison officer. Uh, I had to build working relationships between organizations or people and partner with ECAD to take part in the conference. Uh, furthermore, uh, we had um, to moderate the conference in US, UK, Japan time, uh, sitting here in Bangladesh. So the purpose of the, uh, uh, of the conference uh, how many seven. hours? How many hours you have slept within that week? Uh, in seven days, possibly ten hours in total. <laughs> or less I thought that, that you haven't time. slept at all. <laughs> the kind of workload you were talking about. But let us let us know from you that high level conference, as Professor Hawk was also mentioning, uh, how it yeah. was. Who are the key persons out there? Right. So uh, speaking of outcomes, I believe all these sessions we had around the week had a purpose. And the session host did absolute justice to the full time they were given, whether that be uh, having interactive discussions in uh, breakout rooms in Zoom calls or uh, sharing their research or organizational works. So uh, uh, the keynote sessions or the high level sessions we had at the conference, for example, the uh, right honorable Miss Anne-Marie, uh, who is the member of parliament at the UK. She okay. provided a very important guideline in simple words, that is uh, partners need to uh, identify practical actions. States need to uh, create and finalize their national adaptation plans. Uh, and those already completed need to provide climate communication. Okay, okay. This will enable financial- Okay, so this is broadly the kind of uh, structure we fo followed. Well, I'll come, yeah. in, I'll come back to you, I'll come back to you. Sure, sure. But let me, let me go to Shareen Mannan. Uh, Shareen, I think, uh, I'm, I'm told that in this particular conference, there's a part called small climate grants, if I'm not wrong. And you were the person who kind of handled and worked on that. That sounds very interesting. Just tell us briefly about what exactly it was and how it goes to help the overall adaptation strategy. Thank you, Mr. Basu. So yes, as Dr. Hawk said, from this year, we have gone global, entirely global for the Kobishana Conference. So one of the ideas behind the small, introducing the small grants program was that we always had a 
big number of people, a community of practice um, uh, attending these conferences in regular intervals, and they have been meeting and having different ideas to, you know, collaborate with like-minded peoples and work together, but they never really got the chance to work on it uh, after going back to their workplaces. So this grant was um, funded by the Climate Justice Resilience Fund, and we were, uh, we were asked to sort of, you know, facilitate the group formation and the networking among different people coming from different countries around around the world. So we started off with a networking session pre Gobeshana conference where we had a number of people joining from different countries, you know, from Uganda, from Tanzania, from uh, Philippines, from Bangladesh, Fiji and whatnot. So they attended the networking session and they formed groups, small groups, you know, with member maximum number of three members. And then over the period of this Gobeshana conference, they solicited ideas and come up with a one pager concept note. And okay. then over a period of time, we uh, there was a selection board which had top 10 uh, proposals. And then we had a very quick but very efficient online voting system where within, oh. I think, um, 24 hours, I think less than 24 hours, we received, I think, 1,400 to 1,600 votes for these um, uh, concept notes. And we received top five winning teams. And so just, just, hold, just hold. So you mean to say that the kind of the entries being selected on basis of the voting? Yes. Exactly, we yes. So crowds, our... we crowdsourced the, the most popular ones. Absolutely, absolutely. So the okay. idea behind it was to make it as participatory and the fair selection as possible. So we had a HOVA platform, virtual platform, where we introduced the voting system and we had, I think, 1,500 votes within 24 hours. And okay. We... How many you selected in the day? 10. Uh, top five. five. We have selected top five, and we'll again, uh, you know, have the same process next in the next conference as well. In twenty. And how much have been they being funded? Uh, uh, so each group will receive uh, USD five thousand. This is a small grant, basically to facilitate the network. And they have to work for uh, how long a period to a work period, on this? Uh, one year. One year. They have have to come back again in the next cooperation you know, with regular intervals in the community based adaptation conference, and then during the COP twenty six, we also plan to bring them and have parallel discussions during okay. the development of climate day. That's absolutely fantastic, and. I'll, I'll be coming back to you, but before that, let me go to Tasfia. Tasfia, I think uh, you you perhaps have worked with the nature-based solution part, and now globally, nature-based solution is something which is a new jargon, but coming up very very strongly and very quickly. So, what's your experience on that, and how you how you kind of you, when you handled it? What's the kind of feedback you got, Tasfia? Yes, thank you so much, Jantoda, for uh, for having us here, and and. Uh, let me share my experience on the nature-based solutions. You have rightly mentioned on the nature-based solutions that we have been uh, practicing uh, these nature-based solutions for for decades. Like the philosophy, it's not it's not new. It's exactly. the the term is only new. So what we are doing uh, here, like um, uh, in the locally led adaptation themed globe uh, Gobeshana Global Conference. Uh, we have quite a number of sessions. Uh, I think there are four to five sessions on nature-based solutions. Mm -hmm. And I have been leading all the nature-based solution sessions in the conference. And we have received huge number of responses uh, in, in every session. I, and I think that one of the session was uh, the one of the highest, uh, 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 it has the highest uh, number of uh, audience. Uh, and, and I think over two, 220 people only attended in one session. So that's a huge uh, uh, participation uh, in an online conference we are seeing. So in the nature-based solution sessions, uh, uh, I would like to share a few uh, key messages that we have, uh, 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 that we have received from, from, the, from the audience is that uh, uh, local communities need to be like very integral part of, of uh, during NBS implementation. And for this, we need to grow the NBS community. And that's where ICAD is playing a leading role. We are actually uh, leading the development of nature-based solutions Bangladesh portal. And there we are mainly trying to gather the evidence, both from case studies from local level and also from the scientific communities like peer reviewed journals and papers. And there actually we, we are trying to gather all this evidence and try to measure the effectiveness of nature-based solutions. Okay. And for this, we are actually trying to grow our community. 
So what we are calling these is nature-based solutions Bangladesh network. We welcome. We have a portal. We have we have flaws and charms for joining the network. We welcome people from all over the globe to join our network, the NBS Bangladesh network. It's it, though the term is Bangladesh because it's it's a Bangladesh-led initiative. But we are not thinking. We are not linking people only from Bangladesh. And, no, no, when uh, we call Paris Agreement, because it happened in Paris, not exactly. necessarily <laughs> Paris has done it. But That's it right. Happens in Paris. <laughs> so, yes, we are actually uh, welcoming people to join the NBS Bangladesh Network. And uh, we are uh, uh, welcoming any case studies to be put in Bangladesh or in South Asia. Probably, hey. probably will uh, be like going global. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to kind of actually see the real case studies. I'll be requesting uh, Professor Hogg that. Uh, in this program, maybe in few future few episodes, actually, if we can host and you can see the actual one. works on ground on these adaptations, because we have been talking, talking, that's very important, but also very important to see on ground see. what's happening and actually happening or not. Very important. I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you. But let me go to Mahamuda, Ms. Mahamuda Akhtar. Uh, uh, I think you were part of the, you were part of two important things, Mahamuda. One is locally led adaptation and another is the Delta. Uh, so yeah. let us first, first first know from you the locally led adaptation. What's the kind of situation and how you kind of found uh, during your exercise with the Gobeshwana Conference? Um, at the Gobeshwana Conference, there were like several uh, sessions under the theme locally led adaptation. So um, I would like to talk about um, one session which actually uh, I was the focal of that session and I I also facilitate and uh, uh, present in that session, which is a uh, 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 tapestry session, transboundary without, Shundarban without transboundary one. So the discussions were focused on how is climate change and related uncertainties affecting the well being and identity of people living in the Indian and Bangladesh Shundarbans. And another uh, discussion point was uh, what emerging initiatives align and uh, practices are addressing climate change related challenges in the Shundarbans. So climate change experiences were also explored uh, through photo voice where, uh, where like social uh, struggles in both Bangladesh and Indian parts were depicted through photographs. So as you know, like Shundarbans area remain extremely vulnerable to climate change and other environmental shocks due to their geophysical location. However, being the uh, hot spot of climate change and due to starting work on adaptation prior to uh, India, Bangladesh has experience uh, in adaptation and has vast scope of transformative adaptation. Okay. But um, Still, adaptation-based uh, learning is lacking in both Bangladesh and Indian region. In this regard, uh, one of the main key findings what I can share with you from our like session is people-to-people -people communication is necessary, which can be achieved by global solidarity solidarity network. Okay, so that's that's what you have kind of found in this. Uh in this local adaptation and the delta part you said but my experience is that the adaptation scale of adaptation uh, in in bangladesh part of sundarban is much greater than we find in indian part of sundarban i have i have little experience in indian part of sundarban and have also seen bangladesh part of sundarban but i found in bangladesh part of sundarban the adaptation is actually much greater bangladesh actually is kind of a, a, a peak of the adaptation. So you all have to learn from Bangladesh when it comes to adaptation. No doubt about that. No qualms on that. Uh, great. Uh, let me go to Jennifer now. Jennifer Khadim, uh, you you uh, is a youth program coordinator and I think uh, youth program is a part of a major thing in this particular Gobeshana conference. Please take us through that. What exactly your experience out there? Jennifer. Um, so um, what we try to do is have a pre- conference networking session. And we invited uh, youth from both different parts of Bangladesh and from our different networks that we are connected to. So at the moment, we are trying to um, get uh, more affiliated with the younger constituency of the UNFCCC. And at the same time, we have been, um, you know, the focal point for the Global Center on Adaptation uh, at, uh, in terms of the youth adaptation network that has been started last year from September. 
So what we wanted to do, since we are part of so many different groups, how about we bring people in under one platform? So when we were talking to Dr. Hawk about how we can integrate the youth component into the whole conference, so he suggested that how about we introduce the whole conference and what we do and what we want to do with the, them uh, as a network, we should hold a pre-conference networking session. And okay. actually we are not done because we are still, we haven't, uh, we haven't hosted the post-conference session. It's actually due next week. So next week or uh, uh, the week uh, later. So what we wanted to do is have the youth discuss about their country activities, what they're doing in their own communities. How many countries how, youth from how many countries were there? Um, we actually got applications. We had an open call for application who okay. wanted to uh, join. We had 160 applications from oh. all over the world. But in the end, we were actually, we had to be satisfied with 85 application, 85 participants. And uh, in the, par uh, in the uh, youth networking session, we had uh, youth from Bangladesh. Um, the majority part was Bangladesh. We had from India, Pakistan, um, Afghanistan. Then we had from Fiji, Malawi, Uganda, Ethiopia, and a few from the European countries. And what we wanted to do is have some follow-up events. We introduced the Governor Conference. We told them that this is what we are trying to do. And we wanted to share what we are doing and wanted to see how we can find common elements of collaboration. Just, just to kind of uh, uh, question coming immediately into the mind. Uh, when, when in Madrid, we saw the Greta Thunberg led the huge rally. I was fortunate to be, be there and saw that how, how the, how the, younger generation was actually leading the whole show. We are all behind and watch them in the war that how they are being leading. So yeah. when you were talking to these young leaders, climate leaders across the world, do you find them angry with the politicians? Do you find them angry with the elders? Or do you find them that, okay, we'll be doing our bit? How, how, they, how they are? What's the mindset you find generally? Uh, in general, um what we experienced, I'll just speak from experience, that they really want their voices to be heard. That's they want it. their voices to be heard. Yeah, that's, that's they're really not important. really looking for, in, they're not looking for a fight with the elders. I mean, I'm middle-aged, so I'm not really youth, and I'm advocating for their rights and their voices. So they want, uh, they want them to be heard. They want us to listen to them, that if they think something is right, why can't we see that it's right? Okay. To Okay, great. Uh, Professor Hawk, uh, we have heard the first round of uh, kind of responses and I hope that we can have a quick second round as well. But what's your experience? You have been, I'm sure, being part of many of these 19 seminars. You have feedbacks, may not be in physically, but you have got all the feedbacks. How is the situation? Because there is a general thinking that COVID and post-COVID, uh, the world is going to be... Uh, more difficult to get funds and all everything about this climate change. Climate change actually can go a bit of in the back burner. That's the kind of a general feeling around. So uh, what's your take on that? After seeing this Gavishana conference and the, the responses of all over, how you feel about it? That's a very good uh, question, Jayanta. And, and you're quite right. You know, the situation, particularly uh, economic and financial, it's very, very uh, stressful at the moment and getting funding for anything is going to be difficult. On the other hand, I must say that we had a very, very positive experience. As I already mentioned, the, the response was overwhelming. Uh, the outcome was extremely useful. So what we have decided to do now is this uh, annual conference we, we've been doing every January, we are not going to revert back to the old way, even after people can travel. We are going to stay uh, virtual and global and we will build on what we have done we this time around we started the process and we got so much enthusiasm and interest from all over the world we are going to build on this including the youth that jennifer just mentioned and during the year we will keep communicating with everybody and then next january bring everybody back together again to measure progress and share experience and what we are finding is that if it, almost an unintended benefit of the COVID restrictions of everybody now going online and living in a virtual world is that the virtual world actually connects us better across the world. 
We, mm. I, we were talking to people in Canada, in South America, in Japan, in the Pacific. Mm. We would never have been able to meet unless we came, you know, everybody, 10,000 people in Madrid or Glasgow once a year, once every now and again. But this we can do. We can manage. And we were talking to people around the world. And as, as I said earlier, there is a common thing here which is everybody is dealing with the impacts of climate change in their own context, and they are doing something about it. And in many cases, they are very similar. Deltas, for example. Mm -hmm. Deltas are the same. Mekong Delta, Ganges Delta, the Nile Delta, all the same deltas. So they, they had a lot of things in common, even though they were in different countries, spoke different languages, had different you know uh, circumstances. Nevertheless, there was a common interest for them to do. Urban cities across the world, people living in slums in cities across the world, very common experiences. So we were able to link all of these up and going forward in future, we can do this. And then Absolutely. so the final, the final point though, on finance, it hardly cost anything. So uh, it, 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 you know, it cost a lot of time and effort. My colleagues never slept for the seven, seven nights. Yeah, it's quite clear but, that they couldn't but, sleep. But, but money-wise, it didn't cost very much. And carbon footprint wise, it was practically zero. So, you know, to me, this is the ideal way to do international conferences from now on. No, no, no. And I we will continue. Absolutely fascinating. And also, I think from the communication point of view, it's much more horizontal. You can link any point in the in, in the world through this kind of kind of conference, uh, online conference, because even if you pay money, it's always not easy for everybody to come at a particular time in a particular place to have a program. So, but this is much more easier. Like right now, we are talking, sitting in our own uh, rooms and connected all over. So that's much easier. So yes, COVID has some advantages. We do have to accept that. <laughs> so let's let's go back to a very quick, quick second round. We we have around twenty minutes time with us uh, still. Uh, let's start with again, Sara. Uh, Sara. Uh, as you talked about the, your overall role and your high level thing and all that, but general takeaway for you, you are, you are a young, all of you are young climate uh, specialists, should I say. So you, you are the future of climate negotiation and climate work. So from a, from a conference of such scale, where I was told, Professor Hawke was telling me the other day that 4,000, 5,000 people hearing a conference, that's huge. So what's, what's the takeaway for you in such a conference, Sarah? Uh, attending most of the sessions, what I understood was every region has a different sort of climate problem. Not everyone has the same problem and they deal with it differently. So, uh, and learning from the local experiences is what is to be done now at the moment what is to be cherished now so every problem is different and every region has a different solution for it they technically get it from their experience okay so so you feel that different areas have different kind of problems when they're dealing different that one can actually learn from each other how they're going about it yes great i think uh, here I would like to bring Shareen. Shareen, I think you are also part of this facilitating networking. And what just been mentioned by Sarah that, that one can learn from each other. So what's your experience when you're working on this networking part, Shareen, that, uh, how it goes about? Thank you. Um, so I think I talked a bit about the networking, how it, you know, worked and connected people from different countries. I think the formation of group was pretty random people from with, you know, similar ideas connected. But when we meet these incredible groups, they were quite amazing. You know, people from Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand co coming together with their own expertise, you know, within the group, someone is an architect, someone, you know, working with a grassroots, someone is a government officers, and they're all bringing their ideas together and, and have the full spirit to implement that and, you know, spread those that across the regions. But for me, I think the best take 
of a message from the Global Governor Conference was from a session which was called the Untold Tales of Women Climate Champions. Oh. I think I think that was the I think the best session that I attended, and I was fortunate enough to run the session as well. So this uh, the whole concept was that in in the field of climate change, you know, we always tag women as victims as vulnerable, but we never really you know. Um, celebrate their contributions in climate change adaptation. So this year, through this session, we brought together women climate champions from local level, you know, to Shapkira, to Kurigram, to national, you know, eminent activists, to at the global level. And we had Ms. Saima Wajit, who is the thematic ambassador for the Climate Vulnerable Forum. And the best takeaway from that session was that it doesn't matter where you are from, be it in the rural area, national or global, it only requires that spirit or that determination to, you know, do something for your community. And uh, there are times when women are doing, taking these leadership roles silently in the background and we don't usually acknowledge or recognize them. So the world needs to recognize the indomitable spirit and the incredible work that women are doing and we need to bring them forward at the decision-making table. So that's How many of us? How many of such case studies you you encountered uh, in this so women's section? So we had total six grassroots women coming from different parts of Bangladesh, and then we had I think two national eminent climate activists and two global. So within that session altogether, we got to hear I think ten to twelve incredible stories of women leadership in climate change adaptation. Okay, uh, Professor Hawks, just a quick uh, coming back to you because this is a very interesting point being raised. Uh, I was just wondering that. When this kind of online and uh, virtual conference happens, one point often people talk about that, uh, that, that there is a kind of a disconnect because sometimes people are not all comfortable. And when you are talking about the local adaptation and the people on ground have to talk and all that. So they often feel that kind of a disconnect that, can I do it? Is it possible for me to do it? Is this a kind of a different? So what's your experience? How they could adapt to this scenario? It's a very good question. And in fact, you know, there is a... No, that's a there question. Is a, As a communicator, communicator that comes immediately into my mind. That, I know. How do you communicate? I know. I know. Uh, but, but again, you know, it was a surprisingly positive experience in the sense that the digital divide now, but I'm speaking specifically about Bangladesh. Bangladesh, everybody is online. The remotest villages, they have... You know, they have mobile phones, they can get access to internet, they can speak. They speak in their own language. You, you know, they, you can't make them speak English. They speak in Bangla and we can arrange translation. But they are there, they, they have an opportunity to speak, they will speak. And we, would, we heard from uh, villagers in the, in the village, uh, uh, you know, on a, on a smartphone uh, dialing in and, and talking to us. And, and I can tell you that in the last year or so that the COVID situation has... Uh, hit countries like ours in Bangladesh. Bangladesh has adapted to being on a digital world very, very rapidly. Even the remotest people in Bangladesh have adapted to this. And it's amazing how quickly they have adapted. They don't, don't feel overawed. They, they, they don't, don't feel overawed. Like, they are completely confident. You want to talk to anybody in the village of Bangladesh, you call them up, they'll talk to you. They know where you are. They know all about, uh, you know, Kolkata, what's happening there. They'll ask you what the weather is like, you know, how much is the, is the Hilsa fish there. They, 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 we are Absolutely. now globalized. So, <laughs> so everything has a different kind of angle to it. This is really, really amazing as a communicator because people often feel that, okay, when I have to communicate through online, that's a different ball game. Mm -hmm. But how quickly people adapt. So that's also, a, that's also a lesson that the power of adaptation is so high. Absolutely. And Absolutely. if we can actually translate that power in terms of climate change, then it
are able to reach uh, reach out like experts from all over the world. So which uh, kind of um, another uh, opportunities uh, for us. So, um, so in terms of tapestry project, uh, like since we cannot go directly in the Sundarban due to COVID, so we have started working with the digital diaries method as an alternative plan. Okay. Also, we are aim. Uh, sorry? Uh, are no, you no, please continue. Okay, so um, also we are aiming to involve children uh, for planning and reimagining the space, like um, how they want to see the earth, uh, like how they want to react with the climate change and uncertainty. So we wanna like uh, draw all of these things. Yeah. Okay, uh, we, you talked about Shundarbans and it came up the discussion a number of times. In, in, uh, you talked about Indian Shundarban, Bangladesh Shundarban. In Indian Shundarban, which part of the Indian Shundarban uh, your particular project is ongoing and what kind of adaptations you are looking at? Um, well, in Indian uh, part of Shundarban, we are actually focusing on three areas. Uh -huh. um, so, which is uh, Goshaba. Goshaba. Uh, I'll be going yeah. tomorrow there. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Kultoli and another one is Sagar. Shagar. Yeah. Okay. So, so the three parts of Shundarban. Shagar yeah. is in actually the western part of Shundarban. Goshaba is somewhere around the central, and uh, the other one is at the other part, much closer to Bangladesh Shundarban actually. Uh, so that's very interesting. Very. And what kind of adaptation project you are working out there? Um, actually, we are trying to uh, see what kind of adaptation uh, practices they are doing there. Okay, so okay. mainly, uh, we are focusing on Caritas Indian initiatives. Okay, so, so Caritas Bangladesh, India has been I working in that area for quite some time. I know Pallab, Pallab yeah, and yeah, others have been Pallab working. The, uh, on that. He is okay, actually okay. working on that. In okay, Bangladesh okay, part, okay. we are actually focusing on hydro aquaponic agriculture, but in Indian part, they are actually looking something else. Okay, fine. We'll be definitely talking about it later again. Yeah. Let's let's go back to Tasfia. Tasfia, you, you mentioned about the NBS, but another part I think you were talking we were talking before about the climate services. So, will you just talk a bit on that climate services, Tasfia? Yes, uh, yes, I can talk about that very briefly. Uh, it's that um, in in our conference or at at our century CAD, we always talk about. Uh, something like called capacity building. So mm -hmm. here, climate services, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to build the cap uh, capacity of, of, the, of, uh, the st of our stakeholders on these climate services. Uh, climate services is a very technical term, but if I, if I um, um, break it down, it means that it's the use of uh, climate information, like the production and the uses of climate information and how you generate, how you translate, how you transfer and how you use it. It's basically Uh, the term climate service. What we are doing here is that in our conference, we have also like uh, three, four sessions on climate services, if I'm not wrong. I have been leading like three, four, and I know that many of my colleagues are also leading uh, some sessions on climate services. There actually, we are trying to pitch an idea on, on National Academy for Climate Services. And Bangladesh is uh, one of a kind that uh, uh, that established the example of Bangladesh Academy for Climate Service and Services. And through our model, what we are doing is we are trying to design a course to capacitate people to design a short course. And through in this short course, we also follow a very interactive modality to deliver the lecture. It's not like one-on-one -on -one teacher student uh, lecture. It's that we actually, it has four source of principle. What we are doing is that we do okay. inquiry based learning where participants ask question first and then the course has been designed. So it's very, very interactive in that way. And then we do two, two well learning. It's an academic course. It's an academic it's course. Same course. But we actually uh, reach
out to the selected participants first to to know about uh, to know about their needs and 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 their uh, uh, no, do they get a, do they get a degree or diploma out of there? Uh, but we uh, provide them a certificate when they complete okay. the course okay. and uh, the course uh, has been designed by ICAT, uh, International Research Institute for Climate and Society, Columbia University, SIMIT, uh, Bangladesh, and then Bangladesh Meteorological Department. So these four founding partners run, run this course and we follow inquiry-based learning, two-way learning, field visits okay. to design all these. How many, how many are so far being kind of part of the course uh, as of now? already delivered uh, two short courses, one in 2018, one in 2019, and 40 participants have uh, participated in this course. And But also other than this, we have like around 200 people are in our climate services network who also comes to our different dialogues. Or this is an online course. This is an online course. Yeah, uh, actually, so far we have developed, delivered this like in person. But from this year, from 2021, we are in, in, aiming to go online. So okay. we are in the process of doing that. Sure, sure. Great. I think absolutely great. I think that's another very, very good initiative because I think climate learning, teaching is one area being, I think, not very really explored the way it should have been. Great. Uh, we'll be definitely talking again and again. But let me go to Jennifer now. Jennifer, uh, your youth and other issues being you talked about, anything else you feel that needs to be talked about as per your experience in this global uh, conference, uh, Gobeshana conference? Um, I think... Yeah, I think um, for youth, it's really necessary for them to have the knowledge of climate change first, and then go either for an activism uh, as their uh, you know focus of work, or maybe go for research. Um, we are actually at the moment uh, teaching a group of local students uh, under a project with WaterAid Bangladesh. And most of the students, out of 120 students, I think around 50 to 60 students were part of the Gobeshna conference and they attended a lot of sessions. Um, they're still learning. Um, so this is the point that I want to highlight is that before you want to go and do something, you have to know the topic and you really need to know the problem, the local problem, and then you can take part in the locally led adaptation center. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's absolutely correct. So let, let me, let me come back to finally to Professor Hawk again. Professor Hawk, uh, this is an enormous exercise. I understand this is an enormous exercise, uh, seven days, 24 hours around the clock, all over the world. How do you feel that's output, so an enormous output that you have at your resources now, you would like to use it in the wider and bigger uh, picture of climate negotiation particularly in context of adaptation? Very good question. So I'll, I'll uh, give you two tracts of what we plan to do. The first one is just simply communicate what we have done. Okay. So we have 90 sessions recorded uh, and we will be uh, disseminating these recordings. And our experience in the past of now, you know, this virtual world where we have been doing webinars and, and so on, uh, for some months now, is that the recording actually attracts quite a large audience that watches the recording in their own time who are interested. Exactly. So mm -hmm. the live audience is quite often smaller than the actual... Yeah, same experience with all of us. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So that is a resource in its own right. You know, 90 sessions uh, we will have recordings of, we will publicize them, people can come and visit and watch them. Each one will have a short report as well. So every session will have a report that people can uh, look at and we'll share them with you. So if you want to do, you know, uh, write something on it, uh, please, uh, we welcome uh, you to do that. You can pick whatever you think would be of interest uh, for writing on. And then the second question you said, how do we take messages into the global arena? So I mentioned the Climate Adaptation Summit already. At the summit, locally led adaptation, they gave me very kindly, uh, they gave me three minutes to talk about the Gobeshana conference. So I, I was given an opportunity at this high level uh, summit to talk about Gobeshana. And then in the closing session of Gobeshana, we also had 
the uh, Deputy Secretary of uh, UNFCC, Oves Sarmad, and we had uh, Anne-Marie Trevelyan, who is the climate champion of COP26, the adaptation resilience champion of COP26. And we asked them, how can we take our message from Gobeshna, which is a very grassroots, locally led adaptation message to the high level of the COP26 uh, uh, discussions? And both of them promised that they themselves will become our ambassadors and they will uh, take the messages there. And that those of us who will have the opportunity to go to the COP, and several of my colleagues here have been actually to the last COP, they were in Madrid with me. So uh, I hope my, my young colleagues will also be able to go to Glasgow. Those of us who have the good fortune to be in Glasgow, we can then network there, we can do side events, we can do uh, events to share the, the messages from Goveshana with uh, uh, other people who are there who have similar interests. As you know, uh, at the COP brings together many, many different people of different interests and opportunities for side events and meetings and networking is enormous. Uh, not just following negotiations, but uh, uh, networking, particularly for young colleagues like, like mine here. So that is how we aim to proceed. And, and, and always though, though we understand that virtual has its own advantages, but we don't we can't forget that actual has its own advantages. Absolutely, and absolutely. Perhaps we need a good, even the post-COVID days, we need a good kind of marriage and mix between the actual and virtual. Yes. We might have too many actuals before. We are now right <laughs> now having too many virtuals. Correct. Somewhere in the middle, I think the actual yes, happens. Absolutely. Actual should the, stay the, because otherwise, have... my understanding in virtual is that we have been having so many of these virtuals and they, they, they tend to stay less. Correct. tend to float away a bit. So Correct. I think we have to find out that model that how we can maximize the impact of virtual and actual together. But before I conclude today, uh, uh, a final question to you that this whole issue of adaptation and mitigation being long discussed about. Now, do you feel the discussion is over? Now adaptation is at the prime? It's the win, it's now clear win for adaptation? What's your take on that? I think, yes. I mean, that battle has been won. You know, we fought for adaptation for many years. It was a losing battle. <laughs> People didn't want to listen to us. Now they do. Uh, and I will say, you know, several factors have contributed to that. Firstly, even the rich countries are being affected by climate change. Yes. So they, they now have to adapt also. It's not just us in the poor countries. And secondly, climate change is becoming visible everywhere. It, wherever you look, there's climate change happening. So you cannot deny it. And so it's, it has become uh, important and the, the summit uh, allowed that to take place, bring everybody together and agree. Now it's about doing things about it. That really is the challenge. In terms of doing things, we are still far behind. We are not doing enough. We're not doing it fast enough. We need to gather the pace, do it together. And that's why conferences like Gobeshana are good in that we want to bring together people who are doing it from different parts of the world and join forces and link us up. Uh, that, that our hypothesis is that each of us are doing what we can in our own, but if we connect with people in other parts of the world and other countries, then we will also benefit. They will also benefit. Absolutely. It's a win-win for all of us to share knowledge and learn from each other. That's our a theory going forward, and we believe that that is a way forward. Absolutely, and I think, and I think, and I, I conclude with this that uh, I think that is this whole idea about decentralizing the responsibility. This one union government will do everything is not done now. Correct. So I, I, I hope, I really, really hope that Gobeshana Global Conference will become maybe.
Welcome to South Asian Environment Dialogue. It's a program, as you all know, which discuss about the environment and climate change issues across. This is the battle of our lifetime. Significantly more money and funding is needed. And use this summit as a turning point to create a more prosperous agreement. So the task ahead is vast. We will need to shift the immense power of the market away from the destruction and towards sustainability. Tackle this great challenge of climate change, we need all hands on deck. The leaders today have the power to shape a better future for our planet. We live in the same country. We don't have the same responsibility. We have the responsibility to everyone. 2021 is the year we fight back. Certainly collaboration is a key part of this. President Biden has made fighting climate change Many world leaders and with such powerful commitment that will be very happy. We need to start building a better future now. The human being is the smartest and more ingenious creature living on planet Earth. And yet, it's the only one capable of destroying its own planet. This is the battle of our lifetime. Significantly more money and funding is needed. We use this summit as a turning point to create a more prosperous world. So the task ahead is vast. We will need to shift the immense power of the market away from the destruction and towards sustainability. Tackle this great challenge of climate change. We need all hands on deck. The leaders today have the power to shape a better future for our planet. We live in the same country, in the same country. It's not our responsibility. It's our responsibility to each other. 2021 will be the year we fight back. Certainly collaboration is a key part of this. President Biden has made fighting climate change a top Many world leaders are with such powerful commitment. We need to start building a better future now. The human being is the smartest and more ingenious creature living on planet Earth. And yet, it's the only one capable of destroying its own planet.
also the ones that are gonna face this crisis, you know, for the rest of our lives probably. This is the battle of our life. Significantly more money and funding is needed. And use this summit as a turning point to create a more prosperous, greener, and fairer world. So the task ahead is vast. We will need to shift the immense power of the market away from the destruction and towards sustainability. Tackle this great challenge of climate change, we need all hands on deck. The leaders today have the power to shape a better future for our planet. We live in a country of a country. We don't have our responsibility to our country. Et de notre responsabilité à chaque 2021 est le year où nous luttons. Certainly, collaboration is a key part of this. President Biden has made fighting climate change the top priority of this administration. Many world leaders and such powerful commitments. I can only be very happy with you. We need to start building. The human being is the smartest and more ingenious creature living on planet Earth. And yet, it's the only one capable of destroying its own. We are also the ones that are going to face this crisis, you know, for the rest of our lives, probably. This is the battle of our lives. Significantly more money and funding is needed. And use this summit as a turning point to create a more prosperous, green and fair world. So the task ahead is vast. We will need to shift the immense power of the market away from the destruction and towards sustainability. Tackle this great challenge of climate change, we need all hands on deck. The leaders today have the power to shape a better future for our planet. We live in a country of a country. We don't have our responsibility to all of us, and our responsibility to each other. 2021 will be the year that we fight back. Certainly collaboration is a key part of this. President Biden has made fighting climate change a top priority of this administration. Many world leaders and with such powerful commitments, I can only be very happy with you. We need to start building a better future now. is the smartest and more ingenious creature living on planet Earth. And yet, it's the only one capable of destroying its own planet. This is the battle of our life. Significantly more money and funding is needed. And use this summit as a turning point to create a more prosperous, green, and fair world. So the task ahead is vast. We will need to shift the immense power of the market away from the destruction and towards sustainability. Tackle this great challenge of climate change. We need all hands on deck. The leaders today have the power to shape a better future for our planet. We live in a country of a country. We don't have our responsibility to all of us, and our responsibility to each other. 2021 will be the year we fight back. Certainly collaboration is a key part of this. President Biden has made fighting climate change. Many world leaders and with 
such powerful commitment, I can only be very happy. We need to start building a better future now. Thank you. 